eight, we are going to go ahead and start. Good afternoon. Good evening. This is the uh, Arlington NAACP uh, candidate form for Arlington Independent School District uh, candidates, uh, Board of Trustee candidates. We'd like to welcome uh, our attendees as well as our candidates and thank all of the candidates for uh, their uh, courage, courage, energy, effort, and all of the time that they are putting in um, to running in order to serve this community. Um, I am Elisa Simmons, the president. And so once again, thank you guys for being here. Uh, we are going to open up with prayer and that is going to be led by Billy Wilson, our second vice president. Go bow our heads, please. Most High God, we come before you once again, thanking you for the many blessings that you have given us, our health, our strength, our daily bread, our protection, even in times of trouble. We come before you, Father, seeking your guidance, seeking your wisdom as we seek to see what, how you would lead us and how we, would, how we would pick those who would lead our children. Father, we ask that you would bless us this evening. Our son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Billy. Okay, we will turn it over to the Political Action Committee, which is led by Damon Gardner. Uh, he and his committee uh, have done a tremendous amount of work to put on these series of candidate forums uh, over the last month and, um, or this month and the subsequent month, upcoming month. So Damon, it, uh, it is uh, tossed to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam President, and welcome to the candidates. Thank you for participating in our first series of uh, candidate forums we will have throughout this political season for the special election uh, in May. And our first tonight, we're doing the uh, Arlington School Board, and our moderator for this evening will be Tia Cole, our education chair and also member of our Executive Board of the Arlington NAACP. She is also an immediate past member of the Ladder Alliance, and she's currently a professional of English at the Tarrant County College. In addition to teaching, she counsels and serves on several committees. She's also launched her own development business, the Cole Lab, the COL Lab. She is also the immediate past president of the professional development at the what the team but I told Tia to help me if I forget what part of it is. But uh, Tia, I'm gonna go ahead and put it in your hands and you can uh, introduce the candidates. I believe every, everyone is here now and we can get started. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and yes, that is the Collab, C-O-L-E, L-A-B. And I think you were referring to Bridge Fort Worth as the other position. Uh, but I am so excited and privileged and honored to serve you all as your moderator this evening. Thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time, sharing your um, passion with us so that we can make informed decisions at the polls in a couple of months. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to lay out a few of the housekeeping rules, and then we're going to just jump right into the meat of this thing. So uh, we do have the chat open. For all of those who are listening, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. We do have someone monitoring the chat, that's Kim Jackson, and she will give those questions when we open up time for public questions. Um, when it comes to you as candidates, you will have five minutes to introduce yourself and sort of lay the land of your platform um, at the beginning. And then we will move through our list of questions and you will have two minutes that's it to answer the question you will be muted at the two minute mark so please please try to cover your thoughts in the two minutes because you will be muted regardless of where you are we're not trying to offend you but we definitely want to move through because as you know it can sort of roll over and then other people roll over and then now we're out of time so we want to keep the time so that we can get all of the um thoughts and ideas that you all have and really allow you time to share with us. Billy Wilson, if you can see him on your screen, he's the one watching the time. He's gonna put a check 
if you can show them what that looks like, Billy, up in his box for when you have 30 seconds and an X up in your box for when you have 15 seconds left. So green check for 30 seconds, red X for 15 seconds, and then mute at zero. All right, um, I think that pretty much covers it. Are there any questions? I'm a teacher, I gotta ask, right? Are there any questions before we get started? Awesome, all right, so I'm excited. So we'll start with, and I'm just gonna call random order. We'll start with your five minutes. So you have five minutes to kind of introduce us to you and share your passion and your platform, okay? So um, I see Sarah McMurrow. If you would like to open up your camera or your mic and go forth. All right, good evening. And I do apologize if you hear any banging. The thunder is really loud outside my window. So um, yes, my name is Sarah McMurrow and I am on the ballot for um, AISD Place One. And um, I grew up here mostly in Arlington and um, I attended AISD schools, Foster Elementary, Gunn Junior High. I graduated from Bowie High School. Um, and then I went to college in um, San Marcos. And as soon as I graduated college, I came right back home because I've always known since I was a young child, um, I've wanted to be a teacher. And um, not only that, I knew I wanted to come back home to teach here in AISD. So, um, you know, for seven years, I taught at Lynn Hale Elementary in East Arlington. Um, and those were seven of the best years of my life. Um, during that time, I learned a lot. Um, I was honored with Teacher of the Year for my campus. I was honored with the AWARE Award um, for second through fourth grade, which was wonderful. Um, and then um, I, or I was a teacher at Little Elementary where my son is actually a first grader um, in West Arlington where we live now. And um, this past July, I actually got the opportunity um, to serve as a district-wide literacy coach in Mansfield ISD. So now um, I'm in classrooms every day, directly supporting third, fourth, and fifth grade um, teachers, which it's very rewarding to be able to support teachers, especially during this time. And um, because now I'm employed in Mansfield, that's how I was able to put my name in the hat for Arlington School Board. And so, you know, why school board? Why, why am I running for office right now? Um, I really truly want to serve our children here in the community um, in a greater capacity um, than I do now. And my own child is included. You know, we have almost 60,000 students here in Arlington schools. And I want to preserve the integrity of our public schools. Um, I grew up here, my child attends school here. I taught here for 12 years of my life. And um, I truly care about the success of our district. Um, something that I would like to see, you know, um, I would like to get back to, of course, more normalcy, like, like everyone else, right? But we have to do that safely. And um, I truly feel that I have just the background qualifications, the energy, the drive, and the heart um, to be able to serve. And, um, you know, I really want to, um, you know, give our teachers more instructional time um, that, you know, that leads to a lot of things like less district mandated assessments, um, you know, and I could get into um, different ideas that I have for that, but I'm trying to use my time effectively. I really want to strengthen the home and school connection, not just at a few schools and pockets around Arlington, but in all parts of our city. Um, I served for a couple years as a family engagement liaison, and we have a wonderful PACE department here in Arlington, and I would love um, to increase the capacity there so we can strengthen our connection between home and school. And I would love to retain our top-notch teachers and staff right here in Arlington so we can retain our children here in public schools. And that's me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Next up, we'll go Miss Polly Wharton. And Tia, if I could make one quick suggestion, since we're doing the five minutes, I'll do a check at one minute and then 30 instead of 30 and 15. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Tia, are you, may I go ahead? Yes, ma'am, go for oh, it. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Polly Walton, W-A-L-T-O-N. Uh, I am a um, candidate for place one. 
uh, on the ballot uh, uh, for that office. I am the incumbent for that office. I have been the trustee for the past six years. Uh, I feel like I'm uniquely qualified. Uh, Sarah, uh, my opponent, and I have very similar backgrounds. We both come from strong education uh, experience. I was a teacher I, uh, and a parent, and now I'm a grandparent with three of my grandchildren in the Arlington schools. Um, I, uh, over the years have, especially this past one, which has been so interesting, have inquired, uh, acquired some detailed knowledge of the issues and the challenges that are facing our district. Uh, it's been a really fast and furious year. Uh, I work well with my fellow trustees and with our superintendent, Dr. Marcelo uh, Cavazos. Um, I have not missed uh, any board meetings in the past six years or uh, and have attended all my committee meetings that uh, I uh, am a part of also. I do my homework for every meeting uh, before uh, each uh, committee meeting and uh, I'm prepared with questions for staff if, if that's necessary. I'm a good listener. I am retired. And when invited to attend community functions, I always uh, do my best to attend. Uh, this is a great opportunity for me to listen to members of our community and uh, share uh, the, the messages uh, that uh, uh, they give us uh, with, uh, with others. Uh, I attend workshops and seminars uh, with Great City Schools and Texas Association of School Boards uh, and others to uh, stay up to date. Uh, just attended one last month on equity that was excellent. Lastly, um, the district is faced with many difficult challenges in the next year um, as this pandemic has caused some significant disruption. Uh, I'm ready to get everyone back in school as normally but safely as we possibly can. I uh, feel like uh, we have a, as much left to do as we have already done as far as being in the realm of um, difficult times uh, for everyone. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I have the utmost respect for our school teachers and staff in our schools. They have done an incredible job over the past year um, doing what they knew they had to do for their students. And I, my hat is off to them. I'm so glad I was part of being able to give them a 4% salary increase in our last budget for this uh, 2021 school year. Um, gosh, what a thunder. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, I would appreciate your support uh, from the NAACP and uh, appreciate this opportunity to be with y'all tonight and answer uh, your questions. So I will turn it back over to you, Tia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Polly. Next up, we will have Ms. Melody Fowler. Thank you, Ms. Tia. Well, I'm Melody Fowler. I'm a wife, a mother, a teacher, and a current board member. Um, I'm in place two. And uh, my son went to AISD from K through 12. So I know the district well. I enjoyed serving as room mother for grades, gosh, kindergarten through six. I was grade rep. Then when he got to junior high, I served as uh, PTA president at Young Junior High. And then when he went to Martin High School, I served as president there. So I, I, I love the PTAs and I love the involvement that the, the parents have. Um, I know that my son got a good education. He's at uh, UTA. He's a junior this year, majoring in history. And so I feel like AISD did a great job of educating him. He's done very well in college. In fact, I think he's done better in college than he did in high school. But um, so, and also in addition to that, um, I've been a teacher for over 30 years um, teaching English. I've taught everything from grade six through 12. And then Tia, I share TCC with you and Texas Wesleyan and UTA. So I've been kind of all over. Um, I will say my very favorite is TCC. 
Southeast campus and Northeast. I love the community college and I, I love teaching that level. I also think that it's really important for um, anyone, but especially a board member to be involved in other organizations and really get a feel for different groups across Arlington. So I'm proud to say that I'm a member of the Arlington Rotary Club. I'm also a member of the Greater Arlington Chamber of Commerce, along with their Women's Alliance, the women's group at the chamber. Um, I'm on the executive board of the Arlington Life Shelter. I'm an impact board member, and I've just been asked to serve on the board of the Open Arms Clinic, which is the the free health care and dental here in Arlington. And I'm, I'm very pleased to have been asked to serve on that board. So I think it's important that we give back to the community and I try to do that um, as much as I can. Um, I loved being on the board so far. Um, before that, being a teacher and a mom, I saw that side of the district, but I love being a board member and seeing the other side of the district, the why we make decisions and, and how we make those decisions. And I've really enjoyed doing that. The past year and a half, as we all know, has been very, very um, hard for everyone, teachers, students, parents, board members. It's just been um, a really a, a tough struggle, but I'm very proud to say that we have worked hard to make sure that teachers and students are thought of first and kept safe. I'm proud that between uh, March of last year through August, we were able to give out more than 4 million meals to our students. That was breakfast and lunch. And so we were able to provide 4 million meals to our students, even though they were virtual. We had locations set up across the district that were access to all students and their parents so that we were able to feed them. We also realized very soon that not everyone had technology at home. So we were able to get out over 35 thousand pieces of technology to students that were in need. And then once we did that, we came upon a second problem. What about internet? So many of our families across the district did not have internet service. So we were able to work with Encore and we were able to provide over 3,000 hotspots to families so that the students would be able to use the technology. And that's ongoing. We haven't, we haven't stopped just because some have come back face to face. They still have their technology devices and we're still providing internet service for those students. And I hope to be reelected. I know there's lots more that, that needs to be done and I wanna do. So I, I would just so much appreciate your support and let me continue to do the good work and uh, keep moving the kids and the teachers in the right direction. Thank you so much for the opportunity tonight. Thank you, Miss Melody. We're going to go on to Mr. Richard Weber. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello, I'm Richard Weber. I moved to Arlington as a 22 year old college graduate back in February 1979. My wife and I raised four children. All four graduated from Martin High School. And uh, I have long been a watchdog type as far as the finances of the school district. Back probably more than 10 years ago, I was on financial futures for several years. I served with Mrs. Walton before she was a board member. And um, Basically, I am running because I am really upset. This past year, the school district raised the O&M rate by 13 cents during the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle of a pandemic, people have lost jobs, money is tight, and the school district raised the O&M rate to the highest in Tarrant County by 13 cents. This is unacceptable in my opinion. I feel the current board has lost touch with the citizens and has gotten a little bit weak as far as being able to stand up to for what's right for the students and the taxpayer. I, uh, I'm retired now. I was a computer programmer for most of that time. So I'm used to thinking logically. I 
accept input and make logical decisions. So that is how I would attack anything that's presented that I would have to make a decision on the school board. And uh, basically, if there's a certain way that is different than what is going to be recommended by staff, present your case, I'll evaluate it. So I, I don't know if any of you remember the last time you voted for a school board member of AISD, but it's been three years since there's been a school board election for trustees. The past two years, both, all the trustees were unchallenged. So it's just been placed one, two, and three, three years ago that that had a uh, actual board race. So hopefully I can count on you all for a vote. Um, May 1st, Richard Weber, AISD place three. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Weber. We're gonna move on to Ms. Daphne Jackson. Weiss. You, you were muted for the first part, so go okay. ahead and start over. I just wanna say thank you for this opportunity, Ms. Cole and the NAAC members. Uh, I'm, my name is Daphne Jackson, and I am running for place three for the Arlington Independent School District trustee. I am a wife, a mother, a small business owner, and um, in my business, we deal with intellectual um, developmental disability youth. Uh, we also have uh, homes that's for the elderly. Uh, we also offer that for the elderly. The reason I'm running for the school district is I think the school climate need to be addressed. Um, education justice also is one of the other things that need to be addressed by the boards and culture bias. bias. I want to be the voice for the underprivileged, the poor and the uh, disfavored young kids. I also want to have representation for the black and brown children that's in schools uh, to know that there are people that's on the board that they can relate to or resemble them that's making uh, school, school decision, education decisions for them. Uh, I have also been part of the part board commissions for the city of Arlington on several different of the boards. I have I'm volunteered for several nonprofits. Um, I was a volunteer for Alta Independent School District for the Parents Teachers Students Association. I, um, my company won a award from the Texas Homeless Network. And last year when we was out giving out um, COVID-19 uh, supplies to combat the, the disease, uh, I ran into several families that was homeless with young children that um, that the education hadn't addressed their situation for as the devices so that they would be able to do their homework assignments, um, the lack of internet. Uh, I think that the, the board has gotten to the place that they're not connected with community. Several people in the community that I've um, recently uh, went out and spoke with has never even met any of the members of the board. They don't even know who they are. So the lack of participation in other uh, events in the city, I don't think they really participate in that. Um, another thing is one of my concerns is that I feel like the terms need to be limited on the trustee boards. Uh, because after so many times being on there, you're just being a, a stamp for the superintendent, uh, that a lot of the things are not being addressed with the community. Uh, I like to be part of the, with the education just in, in just, justice in the school districts is that the, um, it's not equal across the board for us black and brown children having the same opportunity or the same resources for other race kids. Um, I feel like uh, black children in particular are um, 
don't feel safe in school because of the climate that they have to deal with, um, culture differences. Um, I do want to support the teachers because they have done an abs outstanding job this year with the COVID vaccine being in place, I mean, the COVID-19 being in place and all the adjustments that needed to be taken uh, for the education. It's, and I like to make sure that, um, let's see, right? I have trying to write all my notes down. Um, but that's, um, my husband and I came in here in Arlington in 1988 with our five children and all of them did attend and graduate from Arlington Independent School District. And I have been an active member um, in the school system from elementary to high school and the last one graduated last year. And I just wanna thank the board for this opportunity to be a part of this this evening. Awesome, thank you so very much, Ms. Daphne. Now, last but certainly not least on this one is Mr. Aaron Reich. You can go forth, sir. All right, thank you very, very much. Before I begin, I would be remiss in this uh, National Women's Month not to say uh, kudos to all of you uh, wonderful women that are on this uh, meeting and to uh, all of those within NAACP uh, the, the alphas, the uh, uh, zeta phi betas, the delta sigmas, the NCBWs, BYs, all of you that do so many things. Uh, and I apologize if I've missed anybody. I'm trying to, trying to think of all, all the relationships that I have. Um, it is full to have a month uh, to celebrate uh, as well as the uh, Women's Day that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago. So thank you for doing this, for the opportunity for us to uh, share our experiences and, and our words and our thoughts uh, with you. Uh, my name is Dr. Aaron Reich. I have been on the board since 2009 when I was first elected. I uh, had a young family then. My wife and I now are uh, uh, proud parents of AISD graduates that are doing wonderful things in the world as a result of AISD. And uh, maybe I'll go into some of that later. But uh, since I've been on the board, uh, I, I ran initially for uh, making a change, a positive change in our district, uh, lifting up our district, which also lifts up our community at the same time, uh, developing uh, collaborations, partnerships, relationships, working with our city as far as the two governing bodies. Uh, that was something that did not exist before I, I ran uh, and was elected, and it was quite shocking, really. Um, and uh, since uh, 2009 to now, I have been board president. I have been every other officer position. I've been the chair of every board appointed committee created uh, the board governance committee for advocacy for our, our community, for our students, uh, for our staff, our teachers in Austin and at the national level. Uh, I have been a champion for uh, change and focus and highlight on uh, communities of color and socioeconomically disadvantaged as well in our district. When I, when I, let's see how I've got about two and a half minutes here. So I'll try to rattle some of this off. Uh, first off, uh, hired a uh, superintendent that looks like the vast minority majority of students that we have in our district in Dr. Cavazos, who is a fantastic leader. He is uh, a previous superintendent of the state of Texas uh, uh, a winner, uh, has done a, a great job. Uh, have worked on and instigated really the first ever strategic plan and out of that strategic plan, one of the things with, uh, uh, as a result of say the bond packages, uh, it was me that started the instigation of we need hub and MWBE representation and scoring in our matrices for our contractors. That had not been done with this district before. Fast forward, we're at a, a point of, uh, with the last bond, I think about 20% uh, uh, of uh, uh, implementation there. And uh, I believe we're really, really close at a minimum for an aspirational goal, if not a, a specific goal of, uh, I would say probably 25% is where the district is at. Um, 
that again didn't exist without me pushing being that squeaky wheel building the capacity building those partnerships and, and trust to get everybody on board with, with doing that uh, the access to opportunity uh, did away with towel fees with uh, having to uh, rent or purchase uniforms and, and fine arts equipment and uh, that was again to provide opportunity for our socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, students. Access to opportunity is what it's all about. We have to create the opportunities and we have to provide the access to make it equitable. Um, yeah. We have passed a resolution that I was a primary instigator for behind the scenes to do a deep dive in our district uh, for uh, equity, for racial and social justice. And that is in the works as we speak. Uh, that is going to be deep work. It's going to be difficult work, but it is welcomed work by many uh, in our community, especially in our district. That will help raise up our students and our staff and our teachers. It is, it is absolute time uh, to do that. I have much more to tell on that, but I, I'm a champion on, on that regard. So I know my time is about up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Aaron, and you will have, or Dr. Aaron, right. you will have a chance to speak more um, in a little bit. So everyone has had a chance to speak. Thank you so much for sharing that information with us. Gives us a great feel for who you are and to understand where you're coming from. So a couple of other things. I want to um, encourage you all to please feel free to just be honest and be yourself with us. We just want to understand who you are and where you're coming from so we can make an educated decision. So don't feel like you have to say anything that isn't natural to you because we just wanna know who you are, right? And then also, Remember, you'll have two minutes to answer each of the questions. You are not required to answer any of the questions. So what we'll do is once I pose the question, then you use the raise your hand feature, and then I will go in the order that I see them pop up. And if you don't raise your hand, then we just won't call on you. You don't have to worry about that question. There's no judgment. Uh, so just so that you know, you have the right of refusal on any question. And also because we've had several people join us um, after we got started, everyone should know that this is being recorded so that we can share it on our website and potentially our social media platform for those who are unable to attend, but definitely wanna to get to know you as well. So with that, all of that said, are there any questions uh, before I move forward? Awesome. All right, so we're gonna jump right into the first question. Remember to use that raise your hand feature when you're wanting to respond. You will have two minutes. You will get the green check at 30 seconds and the red X at zero and then you will be, or at 15 and then you'll be muted at zero. I have a question, I have a yes. question. I'm sorry, yes. Um, I don't have an raise your hand feature on my screen anywhere. If you scroll down to the bottom, do you see a smiley face that says reactions underneath it? I see reactions, yes. Click on that, and then you should see a hand as one of the oh, options. Okay. Try it out. Is that it? There you go. Yep, that'll work. Okay. We'll take that one. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now go ahead and put that one down. Just click it again. If you click it again, it'll go off. Did you get stuck? There you, there you go. go. You got it. Good job. Okay. All right. So when, once you are responding, then definitely everybody go ahead and lower your hand. So that's why I wanted you to try both ways. Okay. Awesome. First question. What are your first priorities? First two, if you are to be elected or reelected. So what are your first two priorities if you are to be elected or reelected. Anyone want to answer that? We'll start with Mr. Weber, then we'll go to Mr. Reich, Dr. Reich, and then we'll go to Miss Sarah, and then we'll go to Miss Melody, and then we'll go to Miss Daphne. All right, so that will be the order. Hopefully you remember because I don't. All right, so let's start with Mr. Weber, I believe was first, go for it. Yes, um, can you hear me? No, you can't hear me. Control yes, away. we can hear you. Nope, now you just muted yourself, unmute yourself. I 
There you go. Okay. The first thing I would do is lower the tax rate for the citizens. The uh, they passed the uh, the tax vote election passed, generating fifty six more million dollars, which turned a large thirty one million deficit into a twenty five million dollar surplus. So you can transfer money into the debt service portion of the tax rate and therefore lower the tax rate on the people that are paying the taxes. There's no reason to raise the tax rate so high and then just keep putting it into the general fund. You can lower the tax rate for the people that have to pay the taxes by transferring money into the bond debt service fund. So therefore the calculation for that part of the tax rate will be lower. That is the first thing I would do. The second thing is just be open and listen because I don't feel the current board is listening. Thank you. Thank you. Next person, just go ahead and go. I think it was me, not, not positive. Um, and I think when we click on the hand again, I don't think it makes it go away. Uh, I was having trouble. So if you see some of us with our hands staying up there, that might be why. So, okay, so I'll go ahead and, and begin. Uh, the, the first two priorities are, are uh, one, we are at the beginning of digging out of this COVID pandemic situation. With that, the priority is taking care of our students uh, and, and taking care of our staff, getting everybody uh, back into more of a normal situation and getting our, our students in a situation of, of really positive learning again, in-person learning. Uh, there's, there's many things that go along with that uh, regarding uh, what we can do from a budgetary uh, priority standpoint, what we can do in offering uh, extra, extra summer school uh, which is definitely going to be happening, what to do on the beginnings of the school year next year in the fall. Uh, coupled with that, there's a lot of focus in the budget and how to make all that work. Uh, but we're also moving at, toward the end of our current strategic plan. And so a, a big priority is moving into developing our next strategic plan to propel our district even further than where we are currently. Um, and that happens over the summer. So just the timing of it with the election uh, in May, starting in June, we go through budget and we will begin our strategic planning process as well. A big component of that strategic planning is enacting that resolution in focusing on equity and inclusion and really looking at, at what there is systemically as far as bias in that system. And at the board level leading, we're putting that into our strategic plan so that it is an absolute, these things are going to happen for our students and our community. Was, was Ms. Sarah next? Yes, I think so. I didn't, I didn't know if you were done, Dr. Wright. Good. Okay. All right. Well, um, the first thing that, um, you know, I'm really passionate about and I would really um, like to contribute and accomplish in accomplishing if elected is, you know, kind of similar to what Dr. Reich mentioned, you know, I, I really am striving for more normalcy um, moving into the fall and realistically, if elected, um, you know, I would probably be sworn in after a lot of decisions were already made, but I believe that we need to develop with all stakeholders, especially our current teachers and staff, um, you know, a really strong plan um, for next year, what that will look like, what it will entail, um, you know, what it won't look like. And we need to communicate that plan very clearly to our teachers and staff. Um, it's really important to have their input um, it's also very important that they are, you know, part of the decision making and they're not finding out about this plan at the same time as the general public. 
Um, and I would also, you know, really like to see our students next year. Technology is a tool and it's a wonderful tool and it's, you know, it's the direction we're heading as a society. Um, but, you know, as a, as a mother of a seven year old high functioning on the autism spectrum, um, I do not want our students to be on devices nearly as much as they are um, this school year. And I understand the need for virtual learning and I, I definitely understand the need um, for equity and you know, in no way, shape or form do I expect our teachers to have to do two full time jobs by creating two separate sets of lesson plans and curriculum um, week after week. But, you know, it's very important that we're taking a good, you know, a good realistic look in the mirror um, and understanding the logistics of what our students are facing in the classroom. And again, I'm in classrooms every day and I'm not, you know, just, you know, seeking out input. I'm living this as an educator. And so, you know, again, that's where I would able, be able to bring a lot of insight and solutions um, moving forward. Secondly, I know I mentioned this briefly in my introduction, um, but I would really want to strengthen an authentic connection between home and school. Thank you so very much, Miss Sarah. Uh, I don't remember if Miss Melody had her hand up. Okay, so we'll go Miss Melody, then Miss Daphne, and then Miss Polly. Thank you, Miss Tia. So the two things that I think I would really focus on, um, number one is a safe return to school for students and teachers. And I think we're all gonna have to feel good about that. We're gonna have to see that the numbers have gone down. We're gonna have to see that the number of vaccines have gone up. I think there's things that need to fall into place before the majority of, uh, of us here in the district would really feel safe about sending our teachers and our students back. Um, I know that we've already been talking in, in our board meetings about how we, we, we can't keep doing the, the dual system with one teacher teaching both. That's, it, it's not fair to the teachers, it's, it's too much for them. So we've already been talking about how we're going to do that for next year. With certain teachers only teaching face-to-face -face and certain teachers only teaching uh, virtually. So they won't have the, the dual jobs. I just can't imagine how hard that, that's been for them. Being a teacher, I just, I can't imagine. So we wanna do that. In that same realm of keeping everyone safe, we do know that a lot of our students have suffered. They are missing their friends. They're feeling disconnected. So we've already been talking about how we can bring in more and more counselors to be able to work at the schools, to, to visit with these students and see if they can work through some of those issues because we know that there's been damage done. There, there has been, they've been very isolated. So we're hoping to have counselors available that will work with students and, and make them feel better and get them back to where they were. The second thing that I would wanna do is to continue to find programs that will benefit all the students. We are constantly adding more um, uh, programs to the Dan Dybert Center. We have academies for fine arts and languages. We have leadership academies. We have world language academies. We need to find more and more pro specialized programs that appeal to all of our students and encourage them to be able to go to. Thank you so much, Miss Melody. Um, next up is Miss Daphne. Get the Parents Teacher Association uh, active uh, so the Black and Brown community can feel like they're a part of the um, education here in Arlington Independent School Districts. So the uh, active Parent Teacher Association, Student Association, it needs to be activated and it really needs to be addressed. One of the other things I would like to, uh, uh, another thing I would like to do is to uh, look into recruiting more brown and, and uh, black and brown teachers. So black, black and brown students will feel like they are appreciated and valued uh, in Arlington Independent School District. I know the recruitment and hiring practice in Arlington, they, um, they tend to leave out a lot of the African-American um, educators. And if they are, they are placed in lower um, school districts or the Title I schools where they receive 
less pair than the, the other peers. So those are the two things I would like to uh, address. Thank you so much, ma'am. And then that takes us to Ms. Polly. Thank you very much. Well, um, I was writing notes furiously here. Pardon me while I kind of pick up and hold it out real far here. Um, uh, my first priority has got to be our kids and getting them back into a normal situation. I think if we've proven anything this year, uh, you know, some may have thought that computers and teaching on computers was going to be the future, but I think we have proved that um, the best thing for our kids, especially our youngest ones, uh, is to be in a classroom with a teacher who has, uh, you know, connected with them and are, you know, and uh, are delivering instruction to them in person. Uh, I think we're headed that direction if all holds together with uh, COVID pandemic and, you know, who knows what that will bring. Um, we've got to keep our kids and our staff and our community safe as we're doing this. Uh, I appreciate everything that Ms. Fowler uh, said about, uh, about that. Uh, the children are gonna be my first uh, priority. Uh, my second priority will be keeping and attracting uh, really excellent teachers. Um, it, it has been a proven fact that the better that teacher is in that classroom with those students, the better opportunity they have to learn. Uh, we may be facing a teacher shortage. Uh, no one can say that, but it's uh, for sure, but it is uh, certainly something that uh, could happen. So I think that uh, not only do we need to hire the best teachers we can find, but we do need, I agree completely with Ms. Jackson, we need to hire uh, minority teachers who look like our kids so that they have role models uh, to, you know, and people they can identify with. So I, I think uh, we're going to have to do two things to, to, to do that. We're going to have to pay our teachers competitively. Uh, that's the reason that it was so important that we were able to pass the VATRE. Thank you, uh, all of you that helped us. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Polly. Um, so let's move on to the next question. And I'm actually gonna pull the next question from a comment that was made and some of the comments that have been made around it. So Dr. Richard, <laughs> comment about equity. And so I want to ask, what is equity? What does equity look like? If we're talking about creating equity, you have to bring it down out of the clouds and have tangible, seeable action items, tasks, and outcomes. So my question is, and, and side note, I couldn't imagine, right, being in the, in the public classroom. I, I have a K-12 or a eighth grade to 12th grade uh, certificate I used to teach high school. And I am so grateful that I am not teaching there during this pandemic because, wow. But that said, what does equity look like? We'll go with Miss Sarah first. And then Miss Melody. And then Miss Polly. And then uh, Miss Daphne. And then Dr. Reich. Four, five. Okay. All right. And I numbered you this time, so I should remember. So we're going to start with Miss Sarah. Okay, so many things come to mind when I hear the word equity. Um, but in regards to our children, um, it's it's just glaring to me that equity is so important. It is so important that each and every student here in AISD is receiving top notch education. And, you know, earlier tonight we referred to, um, you know, the strategic plan. Well, a big part of our district strate strategic plan is preparing 100% of our students for college and career readiness. And you know, college is not the path for each of our children. And so, you know, that's why we have career technology options and we're growing in that in that realm. 
Um, but to truly be equitable, um, we all need to, you know, do some self-reflecting. Um, and I'm not just talking about classroom teachers. I'm talking about all of us. Um, and we need to model that for our children as well. Um, you know, I attended um, a conference, a teaching conference over, um, over the summer and diversity training was a big part of it. And, you know, one thing that really resonated with me was check your bias always check your bias because if you're aware of, you know, your own biases and your own shortcomings, that's number one. And, you know, that could be really uncomfortable to do, but, you know, as a white teacher in, you know, uh, my own classroom, I was always intentional of making sure that each and every child in my classroom felt welcome. Um, and they, you know, they saw, you know, people that looked like them, felt like them, had a family like theirs, um, not only, you know, in, you know, social studies class, but also in literacy, in the books that we read, in the flyers that we send home. And it's so very important that we are all intentional about that. Um, and again, that we are modeling that for our children by the way that we treat each other. Thank you, ma'am. Next up, number two was Miss Melody. Thank you, Miss Tia. <clears throat> to me, equity means everyone has access, everyone has the same access to the things that they want or things that are important to them. We have to make sure that all students have the same opportunities and not only the opportunities, but a way to get there by, by busing our kids from their home campus to other programs, if, if that's what's needed. But we have to make sure that all the opportunities are really all the opportunities for all the students, not just whites, not just blacks or browns. Everyone needs to have access to the programs that will improve their life or whatever it is that they're going for. So making sure not only that, that those opportunities are available, but that there's access to get to those programs and opportunities. So to me, it means, you know, um, um, making sure that the playing field is equal, that it's equitable, and that everyone has the same opportunities to, to those programs. Thank you, ma'am. Next up is Ms. Polly. You're on mute, Ms. Polly. I missed the button. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, well, equity, uh, as both prior speakers have said, are, is tremendously important. And I think it first starts with, uh, it's more than just establishing holidays for uh, minority uh, heroes. Uh, it's changing the curriculum. Arlington has done that. In 2017, we adopted active learning cycles uh, develop that. It's a learner framework that uh, was founded on 12 research-based uh, uh, best practices in order to ensure that uh, increased equity across the district pertaining to the quality of student learning experiences. Um, Ms. Fowler mentioned uh, busing our kids so that they we provide the opportunity, but we give them access by moving them on a bus from their high school to their um, uh, courses out at the uh, correct uh, the career tech center. Uh, we also have to think about who we're doing business with. Dr. Reich mentioned uh, uh, that. Uh, we have to have some uncom uh, uncomfortable conversations about racism. We need the whole uh, team of eight to buy in and be united. And I think we are. Uh, I believe we are united uh, under the amazing leadership of our board president, Keisha Mays, who has uh, done a really good job of leading us on that. We've got to en uh, engage the community in dialogue and surveys. We're about to launch some surveys about equity. We've got to establish equity policies that have teeth. And we've got to gather data uh, on the operations throughout the district. Uh, we're working on that also. And foremost, all of our teachers must understand that education done well is the greatest equalizer. Thank you, ma'am. And next up is Ms. Daphne. Am I I'm on mute. Okay, good. To me, equity means that all students feel safe in school. 
Um, and, the, and the way most kids will feel safe in school is to have representation across the board from counselors to teachers to principals to every um, staff member that's in the school, just not um, uh, uh, security people. Um, so I feel like equity to me is that each and every student receive quality education that makes them ready, college ready, uh, and just not a diploma in hand and put out here in society and uh, say they are graduate, but they're not prepared for the real world because of the limited access that they had to all the other um, activities and the resources that was available for certain groups that's not available to everyone. So to me, equity means having a student that graduates from high school that's college ready and they feel safe while they're in the classrooms. That's equity to me. Thank you, ma'am. And last on that question, as far as I know, is Dr. Reich. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. So uh, a lot of people have covered uh, similar thoughts on, on equity. Um, there's a, a, a graphic that maybe, uh, maybe many of you have seen where uh, it's a difference between uh, equity and, and equal or equality. And it's three different size students peering uh, some over a fence, some at a fence, because one's very tall, one's shorter, and one's shorter than that. And the 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 old solution was give them all a box that's the same height. That doesn't change anything. It might for that kid in the middle, he might be able to peek over that that other kid, still not getting anything. So equity is changing that up where the first kid maybe doesn't get any kind of box. That shortest kid gets all three boxes. Well, all right, okay, I, I don't know, I disappeared. I'm back. <laughs> I don't know what that does on my time, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to be succinct here. Um, so we, we've tried uh, very deliberately, very strategically to incorporate those types of things. Uh, as I've said, the access to the opportunity, creating the opportunities and creating that access. Things that I mentioned like eliminating towel fees, uh, eliminating uh, uniform rentals and, and equipment rentals, uh, that levels the playing field. Transportation was mentioned to our career tech center. That is absolutely vital. Um, our goal is that all students 100% are graduating college or career ready. And part of all of that is the culture of our institution, right? Um, I, I think it was Ms. McMurrow that, that talked about it, that we, we all have to look internally at our own bias. And, and I'm a believer, and I try to live up to this every day. All of us need to own up that we, sorry, I had my timer set here. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Reich. Um, we appreciate your remarks. And I want to um, make sure that I did not miss Mr. Weber's hand. So you did not want to weigh in on this question, right? And if, Tia, if we could, because I did give him a little pause for the time that he was out. If we could go and let him finish his sentence. Sure. Okay. Uh, Mr. Reich. Dr. Reich. Thank you. I was just going to say we all need to embrace that we understand that we don't understand. And if we can keep that in the forefront of our minds at all times, we're all gonna progress forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, next up is our next question, which is a continuation of this discussion on equity and access. And so the question is, there is a decades long standing achievement gap that has been noted by the state um, education agencies and the national education agencies between white students and black and brown students. And so 
first question, it's a two-parter. First part is, do you believe that this is a priority to address? And if so, how will you use policy and influence to address it? If not, why not? And if you are an incumbent, I would encourage you to also potentially refer to things that you have already done to help address this longstanding issue. So I'm going to say it again because that was a lot, right? So there is a decades long standing achievement gap between white students and black and brown students. Do you believe this is a priority to address? If so, how will you use policy and in influence to address it as a board member? If you're already a board member, how have you addressed it? And if not, why is it not a priority? All right, so what's our order this time? We got Miss Polly as number one. We got Miss Sarah as number two. And, and, and actually, Miss Walton, Walton, was your hand still up from the last question? Miss Polly, no, I don't think so. Okay, you, I saw her do like this when she when you said. Oh, she, oh is your hand not up, Miss Polly? Yes, my hand is up. Oh, I, okay. I actually hit the button and got it right. Okay. <laughs> I was just checking with you. Thank you very much, Billy. I've got three on this one. Does no one else want to tackle this question? I'm getting a no and a no. Uh, could you repeat the question one more time for me? I sure can. So there is an achievement gap between white students and black and brown students in AISD. It has been longstanding. It, has, it goes back decades. AISD has been cited by national education agencies for the achievement gap, meaning that black and brown students are not doing as well as white students. So the question is, do you believe that this needs to be addressed? If so, how will you address it as a board member? And if not, why not address it? All right, so sh should I add you to the list of respondents on that one, Ms. Daphne? Okay. Yes, absolutely. We've got four, and I can tell you these are questions that we pulled from interested parties, so they definitely wanna hear what you all have to say. Mr. Weber, thank you for wanting to chime in on that one. So I've got Ms. Polly first, Ms. Sarah second, Ms. or Dr. Reich third, Ms. Daphne fourth, and Mr. Weber fifth. Oh, oh and then we've got Ms. My Melody Six. Awesome. We've got everybody on that question. Ms. Polly, go forth. Thank you very much. Well, of course, we have got to address uh, this and make it a priority. Uh, we have uh, we have been uh, doing that for some time now uh, with our uh, uh, opening things up for access and that sort of thing. But just to make it very short, I see that the best way we can start this process in high gear or get it in high gear is to devote the resources that we, uh, all that we can to our pre-K four um, program, full day kindergarten. We started it this year, but with the pandemic, uh, the attendance was kind of not there. Um, we are going to be receiving some federal money. There's some talk about maybe some scholarships for other four-year-olds that maybe don't qualify uh, for the full day program. But I, I see a robust um, pre-K four program as a great start uh, to really ramping this whole issue up. We've had uh, community-based pre-Ks for 29 years. These are pre-Ks that are in uh, daycare centers where our teachers take the materials and go to the daycare centers and uh, instruct those four-year-olds. But we, all, we now have a full-time pre-K in every single one of our um, elementary school campuses. Uh, and I think we just need to devote the time, attention, and federal money to um, really ramping that up. It, it's just one idea. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next up is Miss Sarah. Okay, 
Okay. Um, I just wanted to piggyback off, off of something Ms. Walton mentioned. Um, I got a great news alert on my phone today that um, universal pre-K is actually um, a big push right now um, in the White House. So, you know, this might be a nationwide thing and that would really change, you know, our, our whole country um, and getting early education um, more accessible to everyone. That would be huge. Um, but yes, um, the achievement gap is very real and it absolutely should be a priority of ours. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, again, we serve almost 60,000 students and Arlington is such a diverse city. Um, it was when I was a student um, attending, you know, Bowie High School. And it's so important that we're looking at each individual campus and, and the needs of the students that we serve um, in that campus. And this is why um, family engagement is such um, a critical piece and such a huge part of my platform. Um, our campuses have a family engagement liaison. Um, and I would love to provide more opportunities, more time, more training for them to collaborate, um, to learn from our PACE department headed up by um, Aaron Perales, and also to learn from each other. Um, because so many of these professionals are so innovative and passionate about what they do. Do. Um, and it would be great to give them, you know, more time, more resources to collaborate. And I know that COVID has thrown a wrench into things, but um, I really love getting parents on campus, but also getting campus personnel out in the community, out of the brick and mortar schools. Um, you know, that's an initiative we really need to see. Um, and what I don't want to see is, you know, teachers just looking at that achievement gap when they look at standardized test data, um, because the reality is, you know, there's pressure in that in that area. And, you know, we don't need to be teaching to the test or sending home extra text test practice or anything like that. Um, we need to look at early literacy and we need to look at strengthening an Thank you so much, Ms. Sarah. Um, next up is Dr. Reich. Well, thank you very much. Um, it, it's absolutely a, a priority. Uh, when I was first on the board, it, it was a glaring priority then as well. The uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged, which includes a disproportionate amount of our, our uh, uh, communities of color, um, they they deserve the same sets of opportunities. And so your question was specifically about policy. What have we done? What can we do? And, and that's, that's a tricky one, quite honestly. To govern achievement is probably the most difficult thing that nobody has really kind of really cracked that nut yet. And so we have tried a barrage of different things that focus on that access to the opportunities to focus on uh, improvement plans on the campuses that, that are real plans. When I first got on the board, they were compliance check boxes. They didn't mean anything. And that was very disturbing when we could use those as the tool to drive that achievement forward. We have made tremendous achievement gains uh, in our populations of color, in our lower socioeconomic uh, disadvantaged populations. If you look at the data, there's been great gains. There needs to be more. And so one of the things that I think we will be moving forward with in relation say to those campus achievement plans or improvement plans is achievement through an equity lens. And that is, I think, an ingredient that has not been there. I think it's been there, but not as a focal point. And I think that would help because everybody has their own learning styles and we have to be able to tap into each one of those. So that's just one example, but there's, it's a big, a big tough issue that we have to address. Thank you, sir. Next up is Ms. Daphne. Um, yes, we do have to address that, ma'am. Um, we have to address diversity, and we have to do it long term, not just when some incident happens. We, you know, we want to address it at that moment and then sweep it back up under the rug. That's why it continues to happen, because we don't want to address diversity long term. I think that the way we can help that is that the current teacher student association plays an active role. So the parents 
of black and brown children will feel welcome and safe and, and, and appreciated uh, with their, their voices being heard. Um, so that's my way of how we would have to address the situation is that black and brown families voices are not heard, it's not valued, and then diversity is just a moment thing that we address at that moment, and then we just go back to what we consider the norm, and that's ignoring the facts. Thank you very much. Next up is, oh, Mr. Weber. Okay, um, it would need to be addressed. Now, I have no answers as far as education. I have to evaluate logically input from people as the superintendent that would suggest possible solutions. So I'm not coming up with a bunch of answers to give you basically any anything that's evaluated would have to make sense. And I would have to rely on others to supply what would need to be tried or <clears throat> what we really need to do is look at where something is working and try to implement what is already working. So yes, I would wanna evaluate something that's working, another standard that's already working somewhere else and try to implement it here. Thank you. Got myself. Thank you for your response, Mr. Weber. So I'm going to ask another question that's closely related to this one. I will say that as a branch, some of the things that we encourage people to do is to look for people who are um, really educating themselves on the issues. And so when people are wanting to take a position of power and hold influence and, and, and develop policy and implement those things, we're looking for people who have thought through kind of what they're up against before they want to take a position. And I will say also that um, it's, it's a little bit concerning if we don't hear about how um, there's a connection between the policies and practices and the culture and outcomes that are created. And so that's why we're asking these questions that are really specifically tied to issues that we know about in the district, because you can't necessarily um, create achievement by a individual policy, but you can create a culture that enables achievement, right? And, and it, it impacts all of your areas from hiring to, you know, who's in the building to services and wraparound services to how curriculum is disseminated, which happens with, you know, the teaching and the development. And so all of those things work together to create an environment that is equitable for every student to get their learning um, at the highest level. And so um, that's kind of why we're asking these questions is to try to see who kind of gets that connection between all of those factors because, again, we want to make an informed decision about um, who we're voting for. And so um, the next question is similar but different. Tia, yes, ma'am. Could, could, could I answer that question before we move on? What question? I think I was number six. The oh, question no. That just Did I miss you, Miss Melody? Yes, oh, that's okay. Sorry. Go that's ahead, right. Miss Melody. Thank you, Ms. Tia. Um, so yes, I do recognize that there is a gap in, in with, within um, AISD. Some of the things that I think might help um, is the increased instruction time. There are some students that don't learn as quickly as other students. And I was always one of those. I needed a little bit more time, especially when it came to math. So I think sometimes if we slow down or have ways that students can absorb the material on a slower rate, before the teacher moves on, I think that's helpful. Supplemental instruction works well. And Tia, you know how well that works at TCC. I think if we do have more of the supplemental instruction where there's an additional person in the classroom that can help students, um, I think that is, is a good thing. I think we also need to monitor students' achievements regularly and timely. You know, sometimes we can't wait till they're three weeks in or at the end of the six weeks. For some students, that's too late. 
Some students need uh, more close monitoring and more often. And I don't know, you know what, the, what the magic number or, or time is, but I do know that we need to monitor certain students more often to make sure that they're learning, that that gap is not increasing. We need to make sure we monitor. And then I think as Sarah mentioned, we really need to link home with school. We've got to find a way to get the parents involved because if the parents aren't involved with the school, it kind of makes the kids think that they don't need to be as involved. So finding that, that link where we can reach out to parents and hope that they will join in with the schools, I think that uh, would help us with that uh, gap as well. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Melody. And again, I am so sorry for missing you on that question. It was so unintentional. Um, next up is the similar question. So just like the achievement gap, there is a longstanding discipline disparity. What we're finding is that students of color are sent home, sent to the office, are uh, labeled, are put in special ed, all of those things at an, an alarmingly high rate um, in AISD that is not comparable to, to reality. And so the question becomes similar to the other one. Is this a priority? And then how do we address it or how do you, using policy and your influence, how do you address this issue? And then if it's not a priority, then definitely um, you can say that. Who is weighing in on this question? We've got Miss Sarah. We got Dr. Reich. We got Mr. Weber. Three, we got Miss Melody, Miss Polly, four, five, and am I missing? I think we lost Miss Daphne. She might have accidentally. Oh, no, there she is. I, I missed you. Okay. Was your hand up on that one, Miss Daphne? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So I am not going to miss anybody this time. We are going to start with Miss Sarah. Okay. Um, well, yes, I think that this is a priority. And, and you know, like you said, um, discipline is a big issue in schools. And um, this is something that we, again, need to be mindful about and look at each individual campus um, and really analyze, you know, our, our discipline, you know, and also like on the heels of a pandemic, how is that affecting, you know, discipline scenarios in schools? And you know what, when it comes to discipline, we need to look at the people, not the programs. Um, you know, as a teacher, I will tell you plain and simple, um, kids need to know that you care about them. You can't teach them anything until you, they know that they are loved and that they are cared for in their classroom. And if you can establish a true relationship with each one of your students um, and really keep, you know, keep maintaining that relationship, um, not only are they going to thrive and learn in your classroom, there will be less disciplinary incidents as well. Um, and, you know, I think that that's something that we all need training on. Um, it's something that we need to make sure our assistant principals are very intentional about. Um, and it's something that we need to be very careful about when we make hiring decisions um, and, um, you know, getting teachers and retaining teachers in our schools. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. Next up on this question is Dr. Reich. Thank you. So I, I think uh, what Ms. McMurrow stated, love, we have to show love. That's so, so true. Um, uh, along with that, we have many situations where uh, those rates are inflated and they, they just should not be. And I, I know she stated we, we have to look more at, at the each individual and, and not just programs. I will say programs like uh, PBIS, the Positive Behavioral Intervention Support, uh, is something that we got pushback uh, when we implemented that in the district. And it was really designed specifically to look at each individual student and their situation and not just send them to the AP and get them in that suspension uh, track. And, and, you know, schools have overall a, a 
reputation of, uh, you know, the, the schools, uh, the, the pipeline to prison type thing. And we, we are looking at that all the time to address that. PBIS is, is one of those situations. Um, there's uh, other things with our security officers uh, as far as training to develop relationships with students, with all the students, instead of just being a heavy hand. We have worked our, our SRO contracts with our, our police department that we have a great partnership with in being less punitive and more relationship building. Uh, and along with that, there's been many great programs uh, that have come into play regarding uh, 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 mentorship programs and that type of thing to build those relationships, build that trust, get to the underlying situations for each child to help raise them up instead of just sending them to the office and getting them in trouble. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Next up is Mr. Weber. Okay. Um, if the uh, the, the AISD has applied a, a zero tolerance to many of its rules. So if the rules are being enforced equally, which is something that would need to be checked, there is shouldn't be much difference that can be done. I mean, you either have to follow the rules or don't follow the rules. Now, I agree the teachers and, and love and care affect a whole lot of student attitude. And that could definitely be an improvement. But as far as when it gets, when students get sent to the office and sent home and things like that, it's far past that stage. And I'm not sure how you can change that and still be equitable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Next up is Ms. Melody. Thank you. Well, I think the first thing needs to be kids to feel safe. If you feel safe and accepted in a classroom, I don't think you're going to have the discipline problems. I know when I was um, teaching six through 12, I'd hear teachers complaining about certain students and this one and that one. And I had to be honest and just say, I don't recognize that behavior in that child at all. They don't, they don't act like that in my classroom. And I know my sister teaches at Workman and she's had teachers that will say to her, oh, this person's so bad or that person's so bad. Or, I had to send this one out of the class. My, my sister says, I don't have those problems with those students. So I think setting up a positive, supportive, safe environment is probably step one. Step two would be class expectations. Kids need to know what's expected and what, what is accepted and what's not accepted. If they know the rules, they, they can play better. They, they can be in the classroom and know what's expected and, and uh, rise up to expectations. I also think that it's important to learn how to redirect behavior. And I know that comes a little bit easier with more seasoned teachers. Um, some of the newer or younger teachers might need more training on that. But there's a way to redirect it. You don't have to call them out and make a spectacle of them and, and escalate the situation. You can learn how to redirect the behavior and that will kind of level it out and it won't rise to um, the severity that sometimes it does. And as Aaron had said, mentorships. I think mentorships are so important. We need more gentlemen and even ladies of color to come into the schools and serve as mentors. Some of these students maybe don't get that direction in the mentorship at home. So we need to find people in the community that they respect, that they look up to, that they look like, and bring in mentors for that students. I think it can make a world of difference. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Next up is Ms. Polly. Thank you. Well, excellent suggestions from the uh, two former uh, and the current teacher uh, uh, that uh, how it is. Uh, I attended a seminar, a symposium uh, in February and a young man named Dr. Brandon P. Fleming was the keynote. He is the um, Harvard Diversity Project uh, guru, whatever. He was 27 years old and he has written a book called Miseducated a memoir. 
and it's due out in June. I cannot wait to be able to read it. And it, uh, it, uh, it's an account of his transformation from a delinquent drug dealing dropout to an award-winning Harvard educator uh, through literature and debate. He found um, an extracurricular class in debate just lit him up. And his quote was, meeting a student where he is is important. We must go to the client and serve them where they are. And, and not just where they are, maybe as far as their abilities or um, whatever, but to, to really look at their, you know, at them, at their culture and um, where they are in, in more ways than just their, um, their aptitude or their ability. Because obviously he had a lot of aptitude, but just uh, he came from a really awful home life and uh, just didn't have a chance. And of course, he reiterated that education is the great equalizer, uh, as so many people in this uh, seminar symposium said. So, yes, it, it should be a priority, uh, the discipline disparity. And I think it's um, I, I think a lot of it comes from, as some of the others have said, a misunderstanding. Uh, Thank you, Miss Polly. And last on this question is Miss Daphne. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I feel like with school climate being, it is so important. And that's where um, teachers that resemble kids of black and brown makes a difference. Um, I feel like um, it affects their performance. Um, they identify with the child more so than uh, Caucasian teachers. Um, uh, I feel like this is where the, the hiring practice should come in in the independent school district. That's where the even playing ground should take, this is where it should start or begin, is that when we start hiring qualified teachers, we should also make sure that they have some form of culture education to let them know that when a child acts out, the first thing you shouldn't do is suspend that child or make him feel that he's not valued or, or that just don't want him in the classroom. And that's what a lot of parents from the black and brown community has, it has expressed is that whenever a child of, of, of a black and brown student, the first thing they wanna do is expel that kid, get him out the room, don't want to uh, address whatever is going on with the kid. So I think that's where uh, the teachers and the, the identification for black and brown students, um, they will have more sensitivities uh, to that, to the culture. That's just my way of handling it. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I will in a moment move to the two questions that have been asked in the chat and then I'll round it out with my last question and we will finish up for this evening. I do want to say though, in hearing all of the remarks, I wanna make sure that everyone is aware that uh, black and brown students are not inherently violent, disrespectful or underachieving or unintelligent. And I think sometimes that that premise can pervade a space. And so when we speak from a place of, um, assuming a need for remediation, we're actually labeling students um, or assuming a need for discipline, we're actually labeling students. And it starts from how you view the student when they walk into a space. And so it speaks to that point that most of you have brought up about hiring and about all the opportunities. But if that person in the room doesn't see that student in the same way they see every student. If that person in the room sees a behavior by this student as aggressive or disrespectful, that they would not see similarly from a student that's not of color, then that's where the problem is. It's not the student that's the problem because students are students, right? Most of them are the same, but it's the adults that are the problems. And so we want to make sure that we're clear that it's not necessarily that students are unable to be successful is that they have not been enabled to be successful. 
But that said, I will move on to the questions in the chat. So there are two questions in the chat. I see one from Miss Stephanie Swan, who says, I'm concerned about whitewashed textbooks, which are attempting to change history, particularly as it relates to the history and achievements of Americans of color. Would you support supplemental tools that will ensure that all students learn the true contributions and sufferings of all Americans? Who wants to tackle that one? I see Dr. Reich as number one. I see Ms. Polly as number two. I see Ms. Sarah as number three and Mr. Weber as number four. I see Ms. Melody as number five. All right, number one, Dr. Reich. Thank you. Uh, absolutely uh, support supplemental materials. Uh, the uh, State Board of Education dictates what our, 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 our textbooks of choice are. And as we all well know, at the state level, it is highly politicized. Uh, I believe there is a great deal of institutional racism and bias built into that politicization. So it is up to us as the local independent authority to provide supplemental materials, which the district does uh, without just the reliance on said textbook. And I believe there uh, is great opportunity uh, to have not just segments of classes, but specific classes honoring our black history, our Mexican American history. Uh, there, there's amazing things that have happened uh, in our United States of America because of persons of color. And I can tell you, I didn't learn it in my school. That's not right. That's not right. The things that I've learned has been over lifelong educating myself and communicating with others and learning. Our children don't deserve that. Our country, our nation doesn't deserve that. So absolutely uh, support that uh, hands down. And with our strategic planning process and our looking at uh, peeling back the layers on the, the onion of inequities in the district, that is going to happen. Thank you. Next on that one is Ms. Polly. Thank you. Did I? Yes, I'm unmuted. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, this is a subject near and dear to my heart. Uh, some of you may know that uh, the last 14 years of my teaching career in the Arlington School District, I was an elementary school librarian. And there's not a better source of independent material uh, for uh, children to find out uh, about uh, anything and everything uh, than our, our libraries. And Arlington is blessed with a very fine uh, a library system that's uh, uh, that um, the librarians are, have all been teachers before and have their degree in library science. So I will just say that um, we need to focus on teaching our kids, our students, to direct their own education and supplying supplemental uh, information to them in the form of uh, primary documents or uh, a supplemental uh, readers and that sort of thing uh, would would be the thing I would vote for in a heartbeat. So uh, from the librarian. Thank you, ma'am. Next up on this one is Miss Sarah. Yes, um, I, I agree with most everything that's been said. And um, it is so important that we are teaching accurate history. Um, and, you know, um, the textbook is a tool, but that is not a curriculum. Um, and, you know, th this is where the art of teaching comes into play and why it's so important. Teachers should be given the autonomy um, to teach their lessons the best way they know how. And, um, you know, our kids need to see themselves in every aspect of the curriculum, not just social studies, but literacy as well. Um, and a perfect example is my very first year of teaching fresh out of college. Um, I could not wait to do a novel unit on Charlotte's web with my brand new fourth graders. And, you know, Lynn Hale, um, I just assumed 
all of these kids will be crazy about Charlotte's Web because as a, you know, fourth grade child, that was one of my favorite books. But, you know, the setting is on a farm and they they just couldn't connect to the character and the plot. And that's just a perfect example of tailoring your instruction and your classroom culture to the children that you serve and being very intentional about that. It is so important. Thank you so much. And I too read and loved Charlotte's Web uh, when I was younger. Uh, the ending always makes me cry though. <laughs> I watch it every time it comes on. Um, and so next up on this question, I swear that is not making me biased towards her. Uh, next question is Mr. Weber. Our next uh, response is Mr. Weber. All right, the state does control what happens as far as the the books used in the classroom. And I would support anything additional that's presenting facts. Facts are what's important. It's how you make decisions. That's how you learn knowledge, facts. So yes, I would definitely support additional facts. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And lastly, Ms. Melody. Thank you. I do think that a lot of the material has been whitewashed, and I understand that. And I like the fact that many teachers now, whether it's, you know, right or wrong, we, we buy the textbooks, but a lot of teachers don't use the textbooks. They bring in their own. And I know at college we can use called, you know, open access where we can go out and find the material that we want, that we think best suits our classes. And I think there are a lot of stu uh, teachers in public school that are doing that. They have the book maybe as, as one form of teaching, but they definitely look for supplemental, supplemental material to bring in. And as Polly said, the librarians are the best. They can find those books and they can help with those lessons. And I think that a lot of our teachers are doing that. And I think we are getting a little bit better about that because I know what I learned in public school and what my son learned are very different. And so he's learned, he's been exposed to a little bit more than I was. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I'm, I'm grateful that he had those um, opportunities to, to see other things and be exposed to other things. So I think, I think we're seeing that whitewashing and we're realizing it. And I think we're doing some things to try to make that better with the supplemental materials and lessons from librarians. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Melody. All right, so we're going to do the next question in the chat and I'm gonna go lightning round now. So we're gonna go one minute responses on these last questions, just so we can get in the really good stuff. So this next question in the chat, just one minute for those of you who want to respond, how would you address the gaps created by the pandemic? I know some of you spoke to this a little bit earlier, but someone's asking for a little more development on those responses. So um, how would you address the gaps that have been created or um, shown, right, illuminated by the pandemic. I see Miss Melody, I see Miss Sarah. Melody, Miss Sarah. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one? Miss Polly, Dr. Reich. Okay, so let's start with Miss Melody. All right. So we're very aware that there are going to be gaps, unfortunately, because nothing beats a teacher in a classroom standing in front of the students and students asking questions and the other students getting to hear those questions and then hear the teacher's answer. There is nothing better than that. There are students who, who say that they like the virtual learning better. There are some students that maybe do better that way and the parents uh, are there to reinforce that. But I think the majority of students really need the face-to-face. -face. And so we've already been talking about what we can do for this summer. We know that we're gonna have to do remediation. We're, we're just, we're going to have to, to try and catch the students up. We don't know that we can get them all the way to where they need to be, but we're gonna try and get them as close as we can. So we're gonna be offering several types of summer programs, some that may be for three weeks, some for six weeks, maybe some for a little bit longer, but we're going to try and 
and tailor our programs to meet all the different needs of students. Thank you, Ms. Melody. Next up on that question for one minute this round is Ms. Sarah. So this is something that I work on each and every day um, as a literacy coach. Um, we look at the standards, um, not only for the whole grade level, but for the grade level and the pacing guide from March on. And what we do and what we've been very intentional about as a curriculum department is we're taking the standards that students missed um, during the spring shutdown and we're folding it in where it's most appropriate in the following grade levels pacing. Um, so for example, you know, second grade literacy, we're taking that reading and writing, um, you know, group of standards that the last year second grade cohort missed and we're weaving it in um, to the third grade curriculum. I think that that's something that we definitely need to be intentional about and um, have our curriculum and instruction professionals um, work on. I also think we need to mind the social gap as well um, and make sure we're teaching social emotional um, pieces within our class, our daily classroom routines too. Thank you, Miss Sarah. Next up on that one is Miss Polly. Well, thank you. Um, I believe that as a board member or board members, we have got to trust our AISD experts uh, on how to address this. They are working very hard to come up with solutions and ideas. I would hope that when we see these plans, that they address the whole child. There's fun activities for summer school. There's physicality to it. There's small classes. There's more time, more tutors. Um, you know, that we meet the kids where they are and so forth. But as a board member, I do not direct the curriculum. I only listen to what our experts uh, at, at, tell us that we need to do and uh, make sure that when I vote for it, it's the right thing. Thank you, Ms. Polly. And then last on this one, we have Dr. Reich. Thank you. Uh, I agree with everything that's already been stated. I, I would underscore the, uh, the, the whole child as was stated. We have got to and are putting lots of resources into counseling, into that social and mental health not just of the students, which possible for the families, for our staff, for our teachers. We can have all the best tools that we can create from an academic standpoint, but if something's not right in that little uh, child's home, they're not gonna learn. It's just not gonna happen. We've got to take care of them. They have been doing things to survive, to get through a pandemic. And we have to address that to me first and foremost before we start saying, how can we get, catch up with the COVID slide? Awesome, thank you, Dr. Reich. Right. So, um, and, and I will say, as, as you've noticed, I take a few liberties as moderator. Um, I, I will say also that as an educator, um, it's important that for me, I feel like as a as a nation, we need to reevaluate that idea of success, right? Because we've tied success to these arbitrary numbers and ages and where there's already not enough time for what was normally being taught. Now we're cramming in more and thinking we're going to win. And what we'll really do is widen this achievement gap and widen the inequities as opposed to really thinking about what makes sense for students. But we first got to tear down that arbitrary structure of what success is and turn it into success as learning as opposed to success as aging. But that's just my two cents on the matter. Um, we're going to move on to some more technical questions, get you out of that hot seat and put you in a different one. Again, one minute on these questions. So um, this question is about MWBE. So we had a conversation earlier, a couple of you mentioned the idea of the strategic plan and wanting to have uh, more MWBE participation. So this question is really about 
creating policy number one because we know that where it may be intentional in your heart it is not on paper as a policy for uh intentionality and culture when it comes to hiring um MWBE companies, uh, and also the intentionality within that marker. So MWBE is a wide spectrum, but what we find is what we see most is really just white woman owned businesses. And so businesses owned by people of color don't get the same opportunities, um, but they get lumped into this number that looks like success when it isn't. So the question is, um, what are your thoughts on an MWBE policy and are you willing to um, push for such a policy to be created? Who wants to answer that question? I've got Miss Polly. I got Dr. Reich. Where are you? There you are. I got Mr. Weber. Where are you? Right there. All right, we will start with Miss Polly. I got you, Miss Sarah. Thank you. Um, I'm on the governance committee, which deals with um, policies and updates and that sort of thing. And as Dr. Reich earlier sa stated, um, this was something that was new to the board when he first came on the board before I came on the board. And um, those policies have been, have been written. They are passed and, and in the policy book. Um, so I, I, I'm, maybe I'm missing the point of the question. Uh, I think in our strategic plan, we can certainly um, uh, reiterate our support for um, you know, using minority uh, businesses in our, with our contracting, uh, but the policies are there. Thank you, Ms. Polly. Next on that one was Dr. Reich. Uh, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, regarding MWBE uh, hub and, and the scoring matrices uh, that are now employed, uh, I, I mentioned that we're, uh, the district has done the, uh, the data to show that we're about 20%. They, for fear of failure, did not want to put a number in a policy, much to my chagrin that I was pushing for behind the scenes. Um, I can tell you we're real close at a minimum to an aspirational goal or a specific goal because they feel comfortable enough now that they've got the systems in place. And in addition to that, they have hired a consultant specifically to address MWBE and hub policy and shortcomings and what can we do to increase that. So absolutely uh, support those level of specificities to include in our policy. And I guarantee they're coming real soon. Thank you, Dr. Reich. Next up on that one is Mr. Weber. Well, I agree with you that the uh, white women have definitely dominated that number. So to some degree, I don't think the whole policy is working just by de the definition that has occurred. Now, I personally am not a big fan because what happens is a developer, a contractor will raise his price, let's use 10%, just because he has to work with different companies he's not used to. So what happens is you turn a $10 million project into an $11 million project. The Board of Trustees is supposed to be watching that for the tax out for the taxpayer, making sure we're getting the best value for the dollar. And personally, I don't think that happens under those policies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. And next up is Ms. Sarah. So I have the same stance um, as Ms. Walton on this. And I do want to note um, that it's really important too that we're looking at what attracts um, you know, several populations to certain professions. Um, you know, one really good example is, you know, my husband, he's a professor at the UTA College of Engineering. And, you know, they are constantly trying to work with organizations and, and you know, get on the um, camp K through 12 campuses to try to attract more women and minorities in STEM. And so we need to make sure that we're getting to the root of the problem, which is really attracting, you know, more of a diverse pool 
um, to these professions. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. And we're going to move to the last question now and then prepare for your one minute final remarks. So Tia, you left me out. You didn't have your hand up. I missed your hand. Yes. Oh, no. Dr. Sarah. No, 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 you're fine. Oh, it was Dr. Sarah. Okay, so we had started. That one's not my fault then. That one's no, not my let fault. me jump in. Don't stay up yeah. very long. Go ahead, Ms. Melody. All right. So we do, as, as I believe Aaron and Polly have said, we do have a policy, but I think we can do a better job of recruiting and attracting those, those businesses that are run by women and minorities. Um, we have the consultant, and I think that is a step in the right direction. It's certainly better than what we had four, five, ten years ago. But I do think we need to do a better job of attracting and recruiting um, those businesses. Thank you, Ms. Melody. And I'm going to let you go first on this next one. So this next question is the last question before final remarks. And the question is, what does a job well done look like? So at the end of your tenure as a school board member, what will a job well done look like? And we're going to start with Ms. Melody. All right. So a job well done to me will be when we have established equity, when all students in our district feel like that they have had access to the same opportunities, that we do see our students are well prepared for college or a career or even the military. And to me, a job well done will be when we have provided those opportunities for our students, if our, and that our students feel like they have received a good education, that has better prepared them for life after school. So to me, it's about it's about equity and providing those opportunities for schools. To me, that will that will make me feel like I've done a job well done. That I did everything I could to prepare the students. Thank you, Miss Melody. We're going to go to Miss Daphne next. A job well done to me is that we have addressed. Uh, the culture in the classrooms. We have also addressed the, I had it written down. Um, sorry. We have addressed the culture, education justice, and culture by, bias has been addressed. That's a job well done to, for me. That's where to look for me. Thank you, Ms. Daphne. We're going to go to Ms. Sarah. A job well done to me um, looks like happy, healthy, well-connected kids um, who love each other, love their world, and they are ready for adulthood and they are ready to, you know, make the world a better place than it was before them. And um, that drives everything that I do as an educator and a mother. Um, and it's not something I can accomplish by myself. We have to work together as a team. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. We'll go to Mr. Weber. A job well done to me will be that the school board is listening to the citizens and our job as the school board is to provide the best quality education for the students that, that the taxpayers are paying for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. We're gonna go to Ms. Polly. Well, I guess maybe I'm just kind of a realist. We've talked about a lot of ideology, but uh, there's really only three things that's, that as school board members we can do. And that is hire a superintendent, uh, approve policies and prepare the budget uh, or approve the budget after it's once prepared. So a job well done is that we have a school district that is running very well with good leadership with good financial responsibilities and with policies that address all of these needs that we've been talking about specifically, uh, of course, equity tonight. So that's what I would think uh, would be the sign of a job well done. Thank you, Ms. Polly. And next is Dr. Reich. Thank you. I'll just say what everybody else said. Uh, how, how's that? Um, 
and, and I'm, I'm partly serious with that, uh, except that we, we have to, at the end of the day, for me to feel like my little part in something that is so much bigger for me paid off is all kids cross that stage and they cross it with pride. They cross it with opportunity that we have helped develop for them. They cross it becoming great adults, great community, contributing citizens, which is what we need for our healthy community, for our healthy economy in our community. And all of the, the strategic planning and the policies and the advocacy and everything else that goes into it, that is what it looks like at the end of the day to me. Thank you, Dr. Reich. All right, we are going to go with last remarks. You will have one minute to give your last and final remarks. And then the next voice you will hear will be that of our illustrious president, uh, Ms. Elisa Simmons, to give the final word for the evening. So before we do that, I wanna say thank you so much for granting us a little bit of your time this evening and sharing your thoughts and passions with us. It was really awesome to get to know you and to learn more about what you stand for and how you will represent the community that we live and serve in. So thank you so much for that. So we're going to do final remarks. And I, since this happened to you twice, Miss Melody, I'm going to give you the right of refusal. Do you want first or last on last remarks? You want first? All right. So we're going to start with Miss Melody. We're going to move to um, Miss Polly. Then we'll go to Dr. Reich. We'll go to Mr. Weber. We'll go to Miss Daphne. And then we'll go to Miss Sarah. And then Elisa Simmons will be before you. So starting with Miss Melody. Thank you, Ms. Tia. Um, I just want to thank everyone for this opportunity to come and visit with you. And I, I was really proud of the questions that were uh, asked of us tonight. I think they're, they're very thought provoking. And I think probably these questions are something at least that I will continue to think about even after this evening. So I'm, I'm really pleased at the questions. I think they were uh, very provoking and deep and I just appreciate the questions and I would appreciate your support. I feel like I've worked hard these last three years and I would like three more years to continue the work. So thank you so much for this evening. Go ahead, who's ever next? Is that me or? I believe. Well, I, I also want to thank uh, this your group for having us tonight. Uh, I have been trying to learn about equity uh, and the issues that involves a little more in depth. And I certainly am spurred on by the questions tonight to do some more of that and to do some more listening. Uh, I uh, just want to say that I would appreciate everyone's vote for me for uh, place one on the school board. I would like to return. I feel like we still have a lot of work to do. Um, we've been working together very well as a team. Uh, we've been cl become closer, I think, of the team of eight uh, this past year just because of the adverse uh, circumstances we were in. And uh, I just would end by saying that I, um, this is not the time to change leadership, so I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Was Mr. Weber next? Um, I would appreciate everyone's vote on on May first. I uh, I certainly feel that the school district has not done the citizens a favor by raising the tax rate, and I mean we're in the middle of a pandemic and people have lost their jobs, trouble making rent payments and everything else. And I raised the tax rate to the highest m &O rate in Tarrant County. And I would appreciate your vote May 1st for district for place three for the AISD. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber, Ms. Daphne. Yes, thank you. I would like to leave with cash, K-A-S-H. K meaning kindness, being kind to one another. A meaning your attitude, that it's just not addressing one set of people, but the entire district of students in the school district. S means sincerity, meaning that you are being uh, sincere with your decisions 
and H meaning humility. Cash are things that we have within us. And those are the things that we reflect and, and our students pick up on. And I would like to have your, um, uh, uh, for, I, I wanna thank the NAACP for having us this evening. And I definitely would appreciate your endorsement. And I'm running for place number three for the Arlington Independent School District. Thank you, Ms. Daphne, Ms. Sarah. Right. Um, yes. Thank you so much, and AACP for hosting this awesome forum. Um, I've enjoyed every minute, and um, I've learned a lot as well. Um, and the questions have been very informative and thought provoking. Um, I truly believe that we have a lot of room to grow um, in our school district, and I'm personally committed and invested in the forward movement of our district. I care very much about this city. And um, wh whatever happens with the election, I will continue to serve our community and advocate for our kids and teachers. Um, and I would love for you all um, to go to www.sarah4aisd.com um, to learn more about why I'm the best candidate for place one. I'm also going to put my cell phone number in the chat. You guys can reach me anytime. Thank you, Miss Sarah and Dr. Reich. Okay, uh, sorry for my delay. I was <clears throat> trying to put in my web information into the chat, but my it's just not working. I, I don't know why. Uh, www.voteerinreich.com if you want to learn more, if you want to reach out to me. I'm, I'm always available. Uh, I, yeah, thank you for, for the opportunity. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I have been I have been a champion for doing everything for all students in Arlington, for making sure that we are as trustees for me as an individual, being that representative conduit between the community's expectations and the school district. And I do not want to stop that. I, uh, in this age of the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, experience matters. Uh, I've heard things about uh, that there's a perception uh, of a disconnect uh, well, okay, let's talk about that. Please reach out to me. If, if, if the perception, as they say, is reality. So have a conversation, reach out to me. That is where it all begins. Communication, communication, communication. Otherwise, we get nowhere. Uh, May 1st, April 19th through the 27th, early voting. Aaron Reich, place three. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reich. And now um, I will leave it to Madam uh, president and or our political action chair, Mr. Damon Gardner, to give final words. Will it be both of you? I'm deferring we'll to Mr. Chair. Damon, you want to go first Thank and then. You, Madam. We'll... Okay, unless Madam President has anything to follow up with, I want to thank all of the candidates for participation and coming out. Uh, this evening, even though you're at home, it's still raining outside. And I want to thank my committee for helping me put this whole event together. And I want you all to be prepared to look out for our next candidate event will be next Monday, March the 29th, where we will do the Arlington uh, City Council uh, Candidate Forum. And if you're looking for membership, the NAACP's website is ArlingtonTextNAACP.org. We're looking for membership in the, in the political action team. And I believe Tia put her information for the uh, education committee. And we have all types of committees that we're looking for memberships and we're looking to put people to work. And I see our candidates also putting their contact information to the chat. And Madam President can uh, fill in a believe section will be recorded and once it's finalized, we will be posting it on our uh, website. And if I haven't forgotten anything, uh, I'll put it in the hands of Madam Thursday if she has anything before we close up. Nothing more. Thank you, Damon. And thank you to the committee for all of your work uh, to put this on. And thank you to the candidates. Good luck to you all. Good night. And we'll have